I don't typically like to address rumors, but I'm not totally above it. And there is a lot of buzz that we are seeing around uh, a, a bunch of clips of, well, specifically Americans in Ukraine because they're speaking English and, and I can understand them. Uh, but you also see these from other uh, guys who are over there who signed up with the Ukrainian Foreign Legion uh, that are uh, essentially saying that uh, life in Ukraine as a uh, as a foreign volunteer soldier is not all it's cracked up to be. So this all kind of started uh, with that airstrike that the Russians carried out against the Ukrainian Foreign Legion in uh, uh, in Western Ukraine, far yet Western Ukraine near Poland, uh, in which uh, a lot of guys were killed, I guess somewhere around, I don't know, the Russians said like 200, the Ukrainians said like 35, I think. Uh, and then I saw reports saying somewhere like around 100, so somewhere in the middle, who knows, uh, but a good number of these foreigners were killed. The Russians, as I said yesterday, uh, specifically targeted these guys that clearly were trying to intimidate them, create discord within, you know, and disrupt this flow of foreign volunteers coming into Ukraine. And, you know, we just heard some, uh, some isolated incidents of guys who were saying, yeah, we're getting out of here, a bunch of people are fleeing, uh, you know, this ain't worth it, and, you know, it wasn't that shocking, I mean, yeah, when, um, I, I don't want to get in rehash yesterday, but it's not shocking that you'll see some deserters during a war. I didn't want to hammer home on that too much and say that this unit was, and that the, the idea of a Ukrainian foreign legion was totally disintegrating, and it was totally, uh, dead, um, but we're getting, we're getting more of these guys putting out videos, uh, and claiming that yeah things are this is this is not a, um this is not a functioning military uh organization so the, the okay i want to address specific claims so the first big video that you see going around is of this guy who had to sneak out of ukraine uh so he says uh posing as like a red cross aid worker because he was told that anybody who approached the border and you know appeared to be in, in military fatigues and had any sort of gear um, would be picked out of the line and they would say, hey, you're a fighter, you know, go back and fight and we won't let you leave. And so this guy said that you know, members of some humanitarian aid organization pulled him out ahead of time and said, hey, you need to strip off all your gear, we'll say you're with us, we'll get you through the border and that's how he claims how he got out. I also, saw a video of a woman uh who i don't know if this woman was this guy's husband or if her or, or was this guy's wife or if this woman's husband was just in a similar position to the guy in the first video because she claimed uh, something very similar that anyone who appeared to be a fighter was getting turned around at the border and they had to pose as uh you know non-combatant humanitarian aid workers so i saw at least two you know americans claiming um this this same story and on its face it's quite plausible because i've never heard of a military that allows volunteers to leave once they've signed up uh you know you kind of you sign your life away when you join a military organization uh and deserters are typically executed if they're caught so i'm not surprised that if they knew that you were trying to desert your uh your post you would be uh held and i'm not saying it's a good thing i think that's terrible I think that, uh, you know, I don't like military organizations. I, ju I, don't, I don't like this idea that you own someone's body for like three years or whatever just because they signed essentially a slave contract or an indentured servitude contract. That's what it is. When you sign a contract with a military, uh, and who knows, maybe these guys didn't actually sign a contract, but either way, maybe it's an implicit contract, you're signing an indenture. And these people get to control your life for, you know, whatever the term of your employment is. And I think that's terrible, but um, because this is such a common thing, and I'm pretty sure every military in the world uh, does this, um, I would, I, I find this story very believable. That if you have deserters from this Ukrainian Foreign Legion, they're being turned around in the border and sent back to the front line. Now, here's where things get worse and a little more unusual. There then was a second video that I saw of two individuals in a car um, who uh, claimed to be part, also foreigners, going to uh, fight with this 
um, uh, Ukrainian Foreign Legion, I think specifically like some uh, some Georgian uh, uh, group, and not from the state of Georgia, from the Republic of Georgia. And these two guys, who were Americans, were claiming that uh, they tried to back out because the uh, uh, you know they backed out of the fighting. Um, because uh, they were going to sign up and fight. I guess they were there as non-combatants. They wanted to fight. Then they found out the guys were being sent to the front lines with no equipment and no arms. Uh, and if they were being issued any guns at all, they were uh, only getting like 10 round mags. Or I should say they were getting one magazine with 10 rounds in it. It wasn't a 10 round magazine. It was a 30 round magazine. They just didn't have enough ammo to go around. So they only gave you 10 rounds. And this was also something that the guy in the first video claimed. Um, you know, it, it sounds to be a pretty similar story. We're getting consistent, um, uh, we're, we're getting, you know, consistent accusations here leveled at this Ukrainian foreign legion. And I guess, if I remember correctly, that was part of the guy, the guy who deserted, that was part of his justification. Was he was saying, you know, hey, guys are getting sent to the front line with either no guns, or uh, if they are given a gun, they only get like 10 rounds. And I guess the idea at that point is, you know, uh, you get 10 rounds, try and kill a Russian soldier, and then once you kill one, go and, you know, scavenge off all his mags off his body and take his ammo. And so these guys are saying that essentially you got sent to Kiev, and you got to go out on patrol, and you're not even armed. You're just walking around. You're just a meat sack. Now, before I get further into that, um, I just want to say that these guys then, uh, these same two guys, put out a follow-up video, uh, which they sent to uh, Cassie Dillon, who I'm not, you know, um, not a big fan of. I don't want, I want to say this like I'm endorsing, uh, uh, you know, her, most of her work or her opinions or whatever. She kind of come across as a very boring, I don't, I don't quite want to say neocon, I don't know if she's that ideological, but just a boring, you know, Republican uh, who happens to be under 30. But for what it's worth, she's actually there on the ground, and so I will give her a lot of credit for that. Um, and uh, you, when you are physically present in a country when something like this is going on, you're able to obtain um, you know, certain information uh, that people otherwise would not be able to. You've got a window into this. So I'm you know, that's the reason why I'm citing her. It's, I'm not, you know, this is typically someone who I see as, you know, writing opinion pieces, not someone doing actual journalism. Well, she's doing journalism in this case, so that's why I wanted to preface that. And so she uh, put up a video from these same two guys basically <laughs> recanting everything that they said in their first video, saying, oh, yeah, everything's great. Uh, these guys, they're so professional. We've got a great relationship with them. And apparently these guys are working in a non-military capacity. You know, they're working as, you know, non-combatant aid workers, they claim. And um, in the first video, I think what they were saying was, uh, you know, they were going to sign up to fight and didn't uh, because of all this stuff that was going on. And they put that out there, and then now that's jeopardizing their position there as non-combatants, uh, you know, because it's making Ukrainians look bad. And that would not surprise me, because it's the same thing that happened to uh, Coach Red Pill, if you remember correctly. He was staying at a hotel in Kiev, uh, and he started saying things that made the Ukrainians look bad. <laughs> and so he got kicked out of his hotel, and then uh, some uh, Ukrainian uh, neo-Nazis came knocking at his door. And were uh, ready to lynch him. And luckily he got tipped off and he was able to get out of there. Um, but these gentlemen, uh, they likely, uh, if they did not recant uh, their, their previous statements uh, about uh, the, uh, the state of you know, supply chains and things, uh, which they did still criticize supply chains, but they made it, they turned it into saying, you know, instead of saying, oh my gosh, this is so terrible, the, you know, the Ukrainians aren't even giving guys weapons or gear or, or vests, they started, they turned it around and said, oh, this is the West's fault for not giving enough arms to Ukraine. They took their old story and tried to spin it, you know, with a pro-Ukraine narrative. And so to me, it seemed pretty obvious that in the first video, these guys were giving their honest opinion, and then they realized, oh wait, we're not in America. Uh, if we say something that will offend our Ukrainian hosts, uh, they'll just kill us. And so that's the way that I interpreted that. You know, um, looking at what happened to Coach Red Pill, I'd imagine that these guys uh, would not be doing too well if this video of them uh, of them talking about how bad it was and why you shouldn't sign up for the Ukrainian Foreign Legion went viral. 
So they had to do damage control. They had to come out and say, no, 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 we're not about that at all. We love uh, these guys. They're treating all the fighters you know, excellent. This is the best thing in the world. Everybody should sign up and go die in Ukraine. So um, that is, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I would call that evidence, but these are the anecdotes that we're getting. And I'm trying to make some sense out of this. I, I have to look at it as, okay, what makes sense? You know, does this seem plausible? And um, I think that most of it is quite plausible. Um, the as far as the initial claims of you know one let's go over the, the charges here like we're in a courtroom like this is a closing argument uh, count number one Ukraine is not letting foreign fighters uh, leave once they've signed up to fight yeah that's what every military does if you thought that you could just quit in the middle of a war once you've signed up to fight for an army uh, you know I don't have to tell you but that's something that I just wouldn't do because I wouldn't, you know, I would want to leave, too. I don't blame you for wanting to leave. I would want to leave, too, but I wouldn't have been dumb enough to sign up in the first place. Because uh, deserters get executed. That's just what happens in a war. So, count number two. Uh, soldiers are undersupplied. They're not being given the proper equipment. They're ill-equipped. Uh, and the foreigners are not getting, you know, armed. Looking at this, uh, trying to look at that from Ukraine's perspective, let's just take as a given for a second, there is some shortage of arms, which isn't that odd considering that Ukraine is the country under siege. Ukraine is the country that's been invaded. Ukraine is the country that uh, um, you know, has lost access to much of its own territory. Uh, uh, transportation within that country very difficult for them. It seems very plausible to me that at any, uh, in any given location across the country, uh, soldiers might ha have a bit of a shortage of equipment. Given that, there needs to be uh, an allocation of those scarce resources. Who's going to get those resources first? Do you think it's going to be the native Ukrainian troops who are fighting for their own country? Or do you think it's going to be given to these, uh, to these, uh, foreign redditors who have signed up to come and virtue signal uh, on behalf of ukraine if i were the ukrainians i would give it to my own people first who i would trust <laughs> to do better fighting i would probably not be not too worried about the redditors and uh you know whatever we have left over they can use that would be my approach but then again i wouldn't be inviting redditors to come fight for my country um so that begs the question, why is Ukraine, if they don't have, if, again, if you're accepting, if they don't have enough equipment to supply all these people who are flooding into their country uh, to come, you know, fight the Ruskies, why would they invite more people in if they've got already more, more soldiers than they have equipment to supply or to equip? Looking at this cynically, which how could you not in this situation? dead foreigners makes Ukraine look good. If they can get some dead American bodies, some if they can spill some American blood, they can then go to the media and say, look, Russia is killing Americans. How could America not intervene? You could say, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible. But, I mean, think about it. This government is in a war that they're not going to win. Their only hope is American intervention. They know that. That's why they keep calling for a no-fly zone. No-fly zone is code for World War III. Even Michael McFaul says that. Even McPhail himself, the former Obama administration ambassador to Russia, who's the biggest Russia gator on the planet, says, "Stop! You know, let's stop pussyfooting around. No-fly zone means World War III. And so that's why Zelensky and the rest of the folks in Ukraine and their apologists in Washington keep calling for a no-fly zone. And so I don't see, you know, so getting back to the equipment issue, I don't see what Ukraine has to lose by biasing their equipment allocations towards their own people and uh, leaving uh, the foreigners, largely Americans, ill-equipped. 
because, like I said, I think it only helps them. It makes them even more sympathetic of a side if, if it looks like, oh, the Ruskies are killing Americans. You know, the Ukrainians don't have to say that, oh, the Americans who were killed were totally, uh, you know, unarmed, uh, patrolling around. You know, maybe they had, you know, a gun with 10 rounds in it. But at the end of the day, we can't be 100% sure, which is why I was hesitant to talk about this to begin with. But there's, there's a lot that's coming out. I think there's definitely something to this story. I don't know what 100% the truth of it is, but there's something to it. And so I felt like I should address it at the very least and talk about it, you know, kind of in terms of, profit, of probabilities. You know, if this, then that. Or, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything 100% for certain because any of these folks could be lying. But there's enough of these videos coming out, enough of these like Snapchat cli clips or TikToks or whatever they are. Uh, these little videos of guys coming out from Ukraine. I saw one a couple days ago from a Brazilian guy. I think there's clearly something to this. You know, a, a, that that Russian airstrike on that foreign legion base, I think uh, it woke a lot of people up. So, with that said, I will see folks back here tomorrow where I will probably be talking about the Fed and not about Ukraine. Uh, because the Fed is supposed to raise interest rates tomorrow's Wednesday, so I believe that's when we will hear about it. Uh, and so, you know, tomorrow's going to be an econ day. So I'll see you folks then.